welcome. So warm, warm welcome to this first seminar in the new seminar series on gender economics. My name is Johanna Rickne and uh, my co-organizers here are Ulle Folke from Uppsala University and Petra Burisova from the Center of Economic Policy Research, CEPR. And for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, CEPR is a nonpartisan network for research activities and it has over 1,500 fellows and affiliates around the world. And today's seminar is going to be divided into 40 minute presentation by Fabrizio and uh, then a 15 to 20 minutes Q&A. And if you have a question at any time during the talk, please uh, type it into the Q&A function. So you can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So please go in there and enter your question. And for clarifying question, uh, questions, Ulle uh, might interrupt Fab Fabrizio and ask you a question. And afterwards in the Q&A session, we are gonna call on people so that you can ask your questions yourself. But please write it in the chat so we know that you want to ask it. Also, the chat is going to be open throughout the talk for a general discussion of the paper, comments and suggestions, and so on. And with that, let me present our first speaker. Fabrizio Silibotti is a professor at Yale University, and he has worked extensively on economic development, cultural economics. He's an expert also on the Chinese economy. And his most recent book studies how parenting choices are affected by economic inequality. And there's also a lot of very interesting cross-country data and work included in that book. So for example, me and Ulle learned that in the US, two thirds of parents think that hard work is a very important value for their kids. But in Sweden, uh, only 10% of parents think that hard work is important. So hopefully you still trust me and Ulle in managing this seminar after hearing that. Uh, either way, we really recommend this book. It's called uh, Love, Money and Parenting, How Economics Explains the Way We Raise Our Kids. And the paper that we're going to hear uh, Fabrizio present today is part of the same research agenda. And it is called It Takes a Village, The Economics of Parenting with Neighborhood and Peer Effects. And I'm super happy to give the floor now to Fabrizio. Thank you very much, Johan, and thanks a lot to Ulle for uh, having me here for this presentation and also for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, this is also joint work uh, with uh, Francesca Costinelli and Giuseppe Sorrenti, who have also written important contribution to, to, to this uh, literature. And it's about uh, uh, the role of uh, parents uh, uh, in the process of skill formation, but not only. So, this is how it all starts, uh, two happy parents with a child. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, there are different ways to deal with uh, the parenting role. Johanna has already mentioned our book. Since the new paperback edition is out, I took uh, this moment also to advertise that. But what uh, this uh, is about uh, is related, but a little different. Well, the way parents and children interact uh, uh, changes uh, uh, as children grow up and moreover other actors uh, intervene well the school of course but also the peers so other children have uh, uh, an influence uh, uh, and this influence uh, grows uh, as children uh, uh, grow into teenagers and then into young adults and arguably uh, some studies have argued that uh, uh, for teenager uh, parents may matter less uh, than peers. Now, the uh, starting point of this book is that yet yeah, parents can uh, have an effect on the process of uh, uh, skill formation, as we call it, by influencing and shaping their, child, uh, their, their children's uh, peer group. Well, first of all, they can choose the neighborhood, uh, the school, uh, the, the set of activity in which uh, to enroll the child, uh, but also they can try uh, with uh, some success uh, that of course uh, may vary uh, uh, in the situation uh, uh, to directly intervene in the process of uh, peer formation. The second uh, element is what we focus uh, on in uh, this uh, uh, presentation, in this article. So the type of questions we ask are the following. Well, first, uh, how do parents take decisions that shape their child peer group? And uh, additionally, how this uh, interact with parenting style, the intervention and other interventions of parents, what we have called 
uh, what we call in the book authoritative uh, intervention, uh, how do they uh, 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 jointly affect uh, the process of uh, uh, skill formation? Uh, and the third, but not uh, least important, uh, are their interaction with the policy intervention that also affect peer group. And so we are thinking here about policies like uh, uh, busing, the segregation busing is uh, an important policy in the US, uh, tracking, so different uh, countries have a different type of uh, uh, school tracking system, uh, etc. So more concretely, what we do is, uh, you know, we do three steps. Uh, today I will also try to say at the end something uh, related uh, to COVID that is not part of the paper. But let me start from the article. So first step, we develop uh, a theory of parenting with peer effects. And so we take uh, the fact that children grow up in different neighborhoods and environments, uh, characterizing that choice, so that the choice of where to locate is something that uh, uh, other uh, uh, papers uh, uh, are trying to do, and here we are not trying to, to go there. So, uh, and then uh, the model, uh, the focal point of the model is the uh, uh, interdependence of peer formation and parenting style as mutually interdependent equilibrium outcomes. In fact, they are both the results of choice. Parents choose what type of parenting style to adopt. Children choose what friends uh, they uh, want to have. And parents can try to interfere in that choice. Then we are going to estimate, this is the dynamic model of skill formation that we're going to estimate using data from uh, Ad Health, which are, uh, I will describe later, it's based on teenagers in US schools. And we're going to exploit information on both parenting style and the network of friendship that is uh, uniquely available in this uh, data set. And then we, are, we go, uh, you know, once we have estimated the model, we run a set of uh, policy counterfactuals. Uh, perhaps uh, the most uh, telling or the one we regard as the most exciting is what happens if you try to move children uh, from uh, uh, a worse, from, from a more disadvantaged neighbor, neighborhood to uh, a better one. And you will see the results provide some uh, uh, caution, but also some policy indication on how to maximize the effectiveness of these type of policies. Uh, you know, sometimes by uh, uh, realizing of some potential problems, we can uh, see how we can do better. That's the spirit in which we look at this type of policy. Uh, this, uh, uh, our work builds uh, on uh, different uh, streams uh, of literature that are already closely related to each other. So there is a, a large literature that uh, uh, emphasizes the importance of family uh, environment uh, and also in some cases peer environment on the process of uh, skill formation. Uh, you know, there, is a, there are many articles uh, by Heckman, for instance, uh, uh, Horacio Tanasio, Daniela Del Bocca, and many others. I won't have the uh, time to uh, make justice to any of this. Uh, the second literature is a literature that looks at uh, uh, the social environment and neighborhood, neighborhood effect. So in our, uh, in our study, as you will see, the school is, uh, 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 is a neighborhood. So it's a set of uh, potential peers uh, among which children can choose. And so, you know, this naturally relates to a large literature, uh, including among others, the work that Chetty and Handel have done with uh, a lot of uh, other people were working on similar, on similar questions. And finally, a literature that is uh, growing to which we have uh, ourselves uh, contributed uh, that emphasizes the choice of parenting style. So I would say the difference relative to uh, the traditional uh, Ekman et al. literature is that we don't, do not look uh, only at the amount of investment that has been made, but also at the choice of the mode of interaction that parents decide to have with children. And here, this uh, will be a salient aspect, as you will uh, uh, see as we go along. Okay, so let me uh, start uh, my presentation with a quick description of the data. We are not the first to use the health, so some of you may know, but maybe not everybody. 
and I will uh, uh, pull some descriptive evidence. Actually, in the article, we have more descriptive evidence than I have time to review now, but this is somehow the motivation for what we do later, not uh, the results uh, on its own, although we, we, see, we, we think that some of that uh, evidence is interesting. And then I will go to uh, the description of the model and to its estimation. So we use the National Longitudinal Study of uh, Adolescent Health, uh, which covers 144 public and private schools representative for the US. Unfortunately, this uh, goes back to 1994, which starts a while ago. Uh, maybe it uh, would be a great, a great uh, uh, time to uh, try to collect new data with the information that uh, it's there. In particular, we use three types of information. Uh, so here, families and children are asked, are surveyed, and there is an in-school survey and then there is an in-home survey. And what we have information and what we are especially interested in is information about the network, friendship network within the school. So here, children are asked, uh, who are your friends? And each child can name up to five children and then we can match them because uh, we can see if, the, if it's uh, mutually agreed and when there is a mutually agreed friendship we say well there is a real friendship uh, so sometimes one child say this is my friend but he's not reciprocated <laughs> uh, then we have information about uh, 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 scores uh, uh, grades so, so that's standard i would say and more especially interesting we have information about parenting both measures of parental involvement in terms of time and resources and uh, uh, parenting style. Let me describe especially in, an especially interesting question for our purposes, which is, uh, do your parents let you make your own decision about the people you hang around with? So we use more than that, but, but this is our uh, perhaps most uh, uh, focal question we, 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 we use. And we, we, this is just a label, so take it as a, as a name. I'm going to call authoritarian about friends, or more simply authoritarian, parents who interfere according to the child in the, cho in the choice of friends, okay? And so, so this, this it, it, uh, how many parents do uh, uh, interfere? 16% in ad health. So if it's 16% of parents are, uh, 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 do not let children make their own decision about the people they hang around with, according to the children. Interesting, this is a very uh, stratified uh, social. So if we look uh, across a uh, 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 neighborhood and we look at the median, uh, uh, well, any measure essentially would go, but if we look at income or a GPA, so at grades, well, it turns out that uh, uh, in poorer neighborhood, uh, parents interfere more than in richer neighborhood. And in neighborhood where there is a higher standard deviation, again, uh, measured, here we measure it actually by the grades that children get. So when the standard deviation increases, then parents become more authoritarian. What does this suggest to us? Well, the second in particular, which is consistent with uh, some of the uh, uh, in cross-country data, but also we have, we have reproduced those at the at the school level. So the, the same uh, these are uh, consistent with those uh, Johanna was mentioned. So the parents in uh, 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 more difficult neighborhood where there is more inequality, they tend to be if you want more defensive. In this case, more authoritarian. So they try to interfere more with the choice of their children that we interpret as a rational choice type of response. Now, uh, this is just uh, uh, a raw correlation uh, that could, uh, uh, could uh, it's the bin scatter point, that, that could come from many places. So it is interesting to see that is very robust. For instance, if we uh, do not compare across schools, but we compare within schools and we use as source of variation the uh, uh, quality or the, 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 the scores, of course, within the same school, a strategy that Karl Oxby, for instance, had used in a different paper, where we find this actually the same result and, and quite a, a, a robust. So uh, uh, when, a, chi when, when uh, uh, the, a child has a peer with, or is exposed to peer with a uh, low 
mean GPA, then parents tend to be more authoritarian. That's the way you should interpret that side. And the standard deviation uh, is uh, the same. So when the standard deviation increases, like in the graph, then parents become uh, uh, more uh, authoritarian. So parents are more authoritarian in uh, uh, when children are exposed to uh, peers that have a low average GPA and when the standard deviation uh, is high. And interestingly, when we torture the data and if anything, the second is more robust than the third. So it's exposure to uh, 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 high variance of uh, children in this uh, cohort uh, variation within schools. So here there are school fixed effect that uh, uh, seems to be uh, uh, an important determinant of the choice of parents to be authoritarian. Authoritarian. These effects, I won't have time to, in this short presentation, to tell you too much, but they are quantitatively large. Okay, so let me uh, give you a sketch of how we uh, present, uh, uh, discuss our model. So, in our model, uh, everyone makes a choice. There are, uh, 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 there are children and there are parents. The children make choice about their friends and the friends to, they, they hang around with have an effect on the process of skill formation. And they, they do so uh, by way of uh, uh, technology that uses as inputs the uh, own skill of the child, the skill of their friends and the parents in the way you will see. In particular, parents decide about, first of all, being authoritarian or not, that's a question I told you before, so it's going to be a binary choice. And second, they will decide on other investment that have, have, are continuous. These are time investment. It's mostly from time survey, how much time child, uh, parents spend with children in school-related activities. And the child would decide who to be friends with, taking as given the behavior of the parents. So here is a, a sketch of the timeline. So in every period, uh, uh, children enter with their own skills. These are high school children. So they, in, in the empirical application at least, so there is the first period, they enter with uh, some, some GPA, they enter with some peer, that the, the, the parents make uh, their decision of parenting style and investment, and that leads to a realization A, of the skill level of children in the next period, which becomes the initial condition, and B, of the French, uh, friendships that, uh, friendship ties that children establish in the next period. And then things will continue all over high school. So I have already uh, introduced uh, verbally this. Here is uh, 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 how the technology of skill formation looks like. Theta i t plus one is, uh, the uh, level of skill, which is me measured by the uh, uh, GPA on which we have data. And this is assumed to depend on a, a you know, CS production function that has as input, first of all, the current stock of skills, theta IT of the own child. Second, the average quality of peer. So this is captures the peer effect. And third, the investments parent, parents make. At this point, I'm not talking about authoritarian or non-authoritarian intervention. This is time that parents use. So this is a, a specification that uh, Francesco Agostinelli has uh, used in a previous paper. It's a CES that has uh, a number of parameters, can have even increase in terms of scale, and you can see the term A that operates like uh, a total factor productivity. So this is like a production function, but instead of producing cookies, it produces uh, skills. Now it comes the new element, which is the authoritarian or non-authoritarian dimension. That's what we call P, capital P. Here's how we model it. So we uh, assume that by intervening, first of all, there will be an effect on the dynamic choice of peers. You don't see this in this equation, okay? Second, it affects uh, everything in the technology of skill formation. So all parameters of the technology of skill formation will vary whether the parent is authoritarian or authoritative. 
what do we intend to capture? Well, there is a large literature in the child psychology uh, in, in field that argues that there are costs of being authoritarian that uh, reflect themselves in the ability then of parents to have influence on children uh, on other dimensions, for instance, by spending time with them. So here we allow all parameters to vary uh, depending on whether the parent is authoritarian or not. Uh, focus your attention on the, the, the A, the TFP. So the TFP uh, should think about this. I mean, the data will tell us, but what we expect is that if you are authoritarian, you're going to reduce the A because it's going to be a mode of parenting that has other type of costs, for instance, ha having less uh, uh, confidence in, uh, uh, you know, uh, less, uh, less genuine relation between parents and children. So this is, data will tell us, perhaps data will tell us that there is no difference. Uh, in fact, they will tell us that there is a difference. So that's the technology of skill formation. The second building block is the uh, peer formation. And here we think of children making their choice based on a, another model, which is a random utility model. Now, we could be more or less uh, uh, sophisticated here. So we, we could think that children are also forward looking and they, they understand that by associating themselves with high grade children, they, they uh, make themselves a service in terms of the uh, skill formation. Here in this slide uh, uh, and essentially in the paper, uh, although we explain why it would not make a difference, but here, think that children are myopic. They just uh, hang around with other children for fun and they are not uh, doing, you know, in a kind of strategic way in order to improve their grades in future. So children uh, make a choice of uh, befriending uh, some other child, which is based on uh, their own, they can depend on their own skill, on the skill of the other person and on the parenting side, plus a random utility shock. So there is a standard decision rule that says, well, we assume that not having a friend, uh, not forming a link has the value of zero. And so when this uh, has a positive value, then there is a, a, a you know, when, then there is a formation. So, sorry, I, the last thing I said is, is not correct. This is a standard shock that has a continuous support. Ignore that, that that's it. Okay, so, so the uh, friendships here require uh, mutual agreement. So, uh, if uh, child A likes child B, would like to be friend with uh, child B, but child B does not reciprocate, then there is no friendship. When there is mutual agreement, then there is friendship. There are two important features in the specification that I will not show you in detail. The first is homophily bias. So we will allow, and we will find that the data speak uh, to that, the children like to hang around with children with the same skills or grades. So the kind of, uh, uh, high-performing children tend to stay together with other high-performing children. I, that's a familiar story for me. When I was in school, uh, that was true, and we find that it's also uh, in the average behavior of uh, American children. The, the second, and this is important, another important element, is that when parents are authoritarian, that introduces a penalty in the uh, utility to associate themselves with children uh, who are of lower skill. And the way we model it's actually increasing with, uh, 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 you know, the distance in terms of, you know, if, if, a, ch if a child meets with another child who is much lower skill, then the penalty becomes bigger. And that's something we estimate from the data. So it could be that uh, in reality, uh, sometimes people say, well, parents can say whatever they want, then children choose. Well, we will let the data speak of that. It could be that there is no effect, but there will be. And then there is the parents' problem. So the parents' problem is the following. Uh, there is, uh, you know, parents uh, uh, solve uh, a fully forward-looking uh, uh, maxim utility maximization problem, and they have two types of intervention. The first is time spent with children, and the second is uh, being authoritarian. Both have a cost. So there is a utility cost in doing those things. Parents may dislike to be tough with their children, uh, again, there's no, uh, we let the data speak. The, the data will tell us that, that there is this cost. It, it could be that it's small, even negative, but, but uh, it will be positive. And, you know, at the end of the high school years, there is a person, uh, you know, a young adult who has some skills, and that's the end point of this uh, uh, value function. 
Okay, then we estimate this model. We estimate the model by a simulated method of moments, and uh, we do it, I will not uh, uh, give you details here, but uh, uh, we use an indirect inference approach. What does it mean? Well, essentially we run a series of uh, OLS regression. One of them, for instance, is parenting, the probability of choosing a uh, authoritarian parenting style uh, regress from child's and peer skills. This is a linear regression that if our model is true is misspecified because there are selection issues. However, uh, well, if our model is the, data, the real true data generator process, well, we can, we, by running those regressions, you would get some coefficients. Well, our method minimizes the distance between the regression coefficient that we get in the data and the one, uh, the parameters generated by the model. This is, of course, we are not the first to use this, this method, but this is what indirect inference does. Now, one thing that we do, we do a few things to uh, assess the performance of the model. Uh, the, the, this, the fit of this regression is generally pretty good, but uh, this is, uh, these regressions are run within school and grade. So at a very, very thin, uh, uh, you know, the localization, the, the, the identification is very local because that's the peer environment children are exposed to. But then we can, uh, uh, you know, simulate the result of the model and then compare it uh, with uh, uh, across neighborhood. That's not a targeted model. Here's what we find that uh, actually the model is pretty successful in replicating cross school features of the data. And here, uh, for instance, here we have created four synthetic neighborhoods. These synthetic neighborhoods are uh, associated with different income level and different income level are associated with, diff uh, with uh, uh, different uh, average grades and distribution of grades. So we, we create this artificial environment and we use our model to say, well, if there is a, a neighborhood that is uh, uh, very wealthy and for that reason, the children have uh, uh, the uh, average uh, grades that are higher, as in the data, so the data tell us about that correlation. Well, how are the micro estimate our, of our model capable to reproduce the pattern? And here you see that uh, reasonably well. So the fourth, uh, uh, the, 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 so this is for instance about the fraction of authoritarian parents, but we, we, we do it on, on several dimensions. And you see that the authoritarian parents, many authoritarian parents are uh, in, uh, in the poorest neighborhood and fewer authoritarian parents are in the richest neighborhoods. What does the estimate reveal? Well, first of all, there are some interesting uh, uh, facts uh, that I will only hint at about the behavior of different parents. So if you look at non-authoritarian parents, which are the vast majority, well, for those parents, child skill and other inputs, so the inputs, uh, the investment of the parents are complements. So it, it, look, it, it is as if when the child is uh, more gifted, ceteris paribus, parents uh, spend more time with this child. It is also true that peers and parents are substitutes. That means that in uh, the more difficult and risky the environment is, the more time these parents spend with, uh, with their children. So if they are exposed to a problematic environment, they work harder with their children. For authoritarian parents, there is neither uh, 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 complementarity nor substitution. The, Cobb, uh, the, the, the previous function is, is essentially a, a Cobb Douglas of, of all the three inputs. In the peer formation, we detect uh, a strong homophily and also that authoritarian parenting style is uh, highly effective. So uh, when you look at uh, the effect, according to the estimation of the model, the, the causal effect in, in, in the sense of the model of the in the structural estimation here, well, that is pretty large. So here is the picture we get. Essentially, there is, when parents make the choice, there is a trade-off for authoritarian parenting. On the one hand, it improves the peer selection. So children tend more often to discard dangerous peers from the point of view of the parents. There is no, uh, uh, you know, judgment value from me. Actually, let me call it in another way. It's a negative externality on the more disadvantaged children what we are capturing here, to be clear. Second, 
uh, uh, there is uh, an effect of a significant reduction in the skill formation technology. So being an authoritarian parent, set the paribus, if you take the, the peers as given, is a very bad idea. So parents, of course, in reality, they could do for, uh, for many reasons. There, there is also here a role for randomness and taste on that. But, but uh, parents, uh, 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 if they do for a rational reason, they do it because really for the, uh, the child is exposed to a high risk to, through the peers. When, in what environment is then authoritarian parenting more attractive? Well, first, when the child has a low skill. Yeah, because the reduction in the total factor productivity is not that harmful in that case. In any case, it's very hard uh, to uh, uh, help the child uh, uh, with other methods. And the second, and most important perhaps, when there is a high likelihood that the child befriends low-skilled peers. So when the child is uh, exposed to a dangerous environment, then there is more, there is more of this uh, uh, authoritarian intervention. That again, has a harmful effect elsewhere in the production function. So bottom line, parents in poor neighborhood live, uh, 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 are more likely to be authoritarian. Okay, so that's what the estimation uh, tell us. That's a picture that is painted. Now, let me only describe one, uh, uh, one uh, uh, experiment. This experiment is similar to a busing policy. Essentially, it takes a, a child uh, from a not so great environment in terms of peer quality and moves it to, to, a, to a better environment. Actually, the experiment we want to do, we don't want to do it too dramatic. So we take a lower middle class neighborhood, just, just below the, the median, uh, which is a uh, like, uh, it, it's actually our second uh, synthetic index that you have seen in the picture. Uh, it corresponds to uh, a neighborhood of Chicago, North Chicago called Waukegan, uh, in terms of actual income, and it's moving to Evanston, which is a, a, a wealthy place. And th that Evanston corresponds in, uh, I mean, Evanston and Waukegan are just labels. These are the second and the fourth uh, synthetic neighborhood, like you see before. I just want to emphasize that we don't take the children from the worst environment and move to the best. We move to a, to a okay, but not great, to an excellent peer environment. So the question we are asking here is specifically the following. How does the treatment effect change when the intervention is scaled up and how do parents respond to the policy? So we are thinking about what the difference in moving in one child in isolation that leaves essentially the environment the same both where the child is uh, moved from, from, both in Waukegan and in Evanston. We are comparing a situation where you take many children in Waukegan and you move them simultaneously to Evanston. The model has something to tell us about that. First of all, when you move many children from Waukegan to Evanston, it's very likely, according to our, our model, that they will hang uh, uh, together. So they will, uh, they will become friends with each other. Of course, if there is only one child from Waukegan, that's impossible. The second is the behavior of the moved parents. So these parents will stop being authoritarian because they, they are, the children are now exposed to a better peer environment and that we know has a positive effect for the reason I discussed before. Well, not, it's not, not all good news because if those parents were non-authoritarian in the first place and were just making time investment, now they will, will relax a little because the peer environment is better. From the point of view of the receiving parents instead, we're going to have a defensive reply, uh, response as, as they see more children coming from the more disadvantaged neighborhood, more of them will become actually authoritarian. And here is the main picture for this uh, 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 policy experiment. Uh, on the vertical axis, uh, we have the mean effect uh, on log skill of the moved children, and the horizontal is how many children we move simultaneously. So, the highest effect is when you only move one child. So the child is moved in isolation, is in a better environment. Incidentally, this effect, uh, which is based on the, on the estimated parameter of the model, is pretty large and it's, it's, it's on the upper end of the estimates in the literature. So we start from a situation where this is, this is a, good, a good thing to do. And you know, as you increase the number of children you move, you see that the effect declines. And when many children, as many as 30 or more are moved, that effect, uh, the, 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 the effect is half, essentially. So it's half as effective. So, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's sad, but that's what the model says. So 
there are many things that are changing that I, I told you uh, before, but let me just uh, show you uh, the, 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 the response of the parents in the receiving community. So these are the wealthy parents of Evanston, uh, and this is the mean effect on the log skill of their children. So receiving a small number of children from Wokigan has essentially no effect, it's essentially a zero that you see on the, on the left of this. Then as you move, there is some negative effect, not very big indeed, but uh, compare the blue with the, with the red line. The, the red line is the case in which you do not allow the parents to change their behavior. So if you didn't allow the parent, the wealthy parents to become more authoritarian, it would actually be worse for their children. So this, uh, again, sadly enough, suggests that there is some rationality in this type of response. And this is exactly what makes uh, the, the policy less effective as we increase the number of kids. Okay, so, you know, we do this and we do a number of other things that I, I don't have time to talk because I want to use the last five minutes to, to talk about uh, uh, something else. But, uh, you know, we look, for instance, at, at the effect uh, of residential segregation and desegregation. The bottom line is that uh, policy should work hard on one margin, which, which, which we call technically subsidized authoritative investment. What is this about? Well, for instance, the provision of good uh, child care, like in Sweden, uh, very accessible uh, at an earlier age would be a good thing because it equalizes the initial condition. And also the support to parents by flexible work modes would be uh, an important thing to do. Okay, I, let me give you, let me uh, take uh, uh, five minutes to uh, do something that we are doing uh, these days. So, we think that this model, uh, of course, you know, these are data from the 90s, but uh, there are a number of things that we would like to be able to say about COVID and that we cannot say because uh, we don't have the data. We don't know, we, have, we don't have previous COVID uh, episodes. So what can, can we learn from the lenses of this model? Well, this model emphasizes the, emphasizes the uh, peer quality. And, and I think this is something that has been overlooked. So when you, close down schools, children go back to their uh, family environments. And here, suppose that that means to go back to the block. I mean, schools in the US are, are very segregated and it's uh, something that has been discussed. And, but uh, still, they are a moment in which children from different backgrounds meet. In Europe, it would be even more perhaps. But when you go to the block level, the segregation is stronger. It's actually something we see uh, in the data. So somehow we are moving to an environment where there is higher segregation to begin with. So the, the, the red uh, uh, fitted line, it shows you uh, what happens when you, uh, uh, when you move. So here we are essentially looking at the characteristic of the census block and every child, instead of interacting with this peer in the school, they interact with the peer of the uh, census block. We don't have an identifier for a census block, but we can reconstruct it through the characteristics of that. So, so you know, we think that this is reasonable or reliable. So somehow the, the, this, this, whole, this shock like COVID makes uh, uh, already the, the peer interaction more unequal, almost like construction. What is according to the estimated uh, effect in the model? How much does it matter for the uh, uh, interactions with, uh, uh, for, for, for the process of skill formation. Okay, so the way we uh, calibrate the average effect of COVID shock, it's a little, you know, in thin air. We are trying to look at uh, uh, when children uh, take summer breaks, etc. but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my hands uh, on, on that. But uh, the model tells us about differential effect across the social ladder. So it's, it tells us something about inequality. And so what you can see, this is uh, uh, the loss, percentage loss in skill as, me as measured by average uh, uh, grades. It can also be translated in, into earnings and it's a pretty uh, significant number. It's in the order of a few thousand dollars uh, on average. So it goes, it goes down here. It means that for the richest kid, uh, there is no effect, and then there is no effect. It could be that there is still an effect, depending on how exactly you calibrate. But but the important thing is the comparison between zero and the minus forty percent. So there is a large effect of this. This is the compound effect of many things: the direct peer uh, effect and the effect of, of parents. In fact, 
parents do something good in, in here. They don't do much uh, in this model uh, because in, in the richest part of the distribution because there is not much need to do uh, there much. So this dashed line tells you what if parents did not respond. And you see that parents actually in poor neighborhood try their best uh, you know, in, 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 in the model to, to, to help. Because if they didn't intervene, rather than losing 40%, they would lose 60% of their, of their cognitive skill. This is after one year, after one year of uh, isolation from school. What happens after the entire high school? Suppose that COVID ends after one year. We all hope, we, we know it's, it's a bit optimistic perhaps. Well, this is what you see. People say, oh, the situation in the end is uh, much better. Sure, the situation is not so extreme as after the children go back to school because the school starts doing its work. Its work is again to create uh, interaction between different types of children. But don't be uh, uh, too enthusiastic about that because it still says that uh, the negative effect is twice as large as, uh, in the, in, for the poorest children than for the richest children. Okay? And if parents do not, uh, did not intervene, the effect will be even larger. We have also tried to do something in between in which parents can intervene but their intervention depends on the flexibility of their job arrangement. You know, some people can work at home, some, some can't, and the effect is, is, uh, is in between. So parental intervention uh, helps, but uh, uh, still uh, uh, the society that it comes out of COVID is going to be characterized as much higher inequality than otherwise. Part of the problem is that parents will become more defensive, especially the more uh, lucky parents will tend to uh, invite their children to stick around with the fewer uh, you know, high-performing children. And so our model has a prediction that uh, the, the, the number of uh, uh, lucky, uh, of, uh, of retired parents will increase. In fact, it will go up by something like, yeah, depending on, on the assumption we make, between five and eight percentage point. Remember that uh, it was, uh, 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 so in, in, the, in the poorest area, sorry, I should say. So in, in the richest area, you see there is no effect essentially on parenting, on parenting style. But in the poorest area, the, the, more, uh, the better performing uh, uh, children will have parents who become like more worried and may, more of them become authoritarian. The average number of a percentage of the parent is 16 percentage point. So plus a percentage point, it's, it's, a, it's a very large number. And the other thing that we can say, and on this I will conclude, is uh, peer separation. That's something we don't really have in the model, so we don't have much to say, but we still, we can, we can look at it empirically. And it turns out that, you know, since this is a repeated survey, uh, some children uh, lose peers, lose friends, in the following uh, uh, qualified sense. Uh, these children do not appear in the service, in the subsequent service. It could be because they have really moved. It could be because uh, of other reasons. So it could be because uh, the parents have uh, refused to reply after they have replied the first time. So there is some noise here. But the interesting, which we think this noise would create an attenuation bias, if anything. But the interesting, surprisingly, there is a large effect on the uh, 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 skill formation of the remaining children. So this is something we didn't expect and, and we found, we check it out with curiosity. And of course, COVID means a separation from children that don't live uh, just next door. So this can be an important effect. It's true, you know, it's very robust. It, uh, if, you, if you lose more than one friend, it's uh, twice the effect or, or, uh, than if you lose uh, one friend. In losing a friend in, in, in this sense. It's also segregated as, across the social level. So it's, uh, it's more important uh, for low-skilled children, especially for, for low-grade children, especially when they lose uh, children, uh, uh, friends uh, who have uh, good grades, as you can uh, intuitively imagine. So we have tried, and I, I, I really want to open the floor to discussion, but we have tried to factor in this into our simulation. And so making some assumption about uh, children links get, that get lost and factoring in with the discipline of this uh, regression result, the heterogeneous effect. And what we get is once again, a very sharp, sharply, uh, a sharp increase in inequality in the sense that once again, 
There are some effects for the rich children, the one you see on the, on the right. This is, a, re remember, this is by census block. So on the right, you see the, the riches. And you see that 60% decrease in uh, 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 log scale of children for the poorest uh, uh, children. If we, if we factor in this uh, heterogeneous effect, you have not seen uh, uh, the, the, the regression. I only show you the average, but this, this, is, uh, 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 this average, uh, you know, there is a lot of heterogeneity. It's particularly important for children in lower uh, income neighborhood, and it's more important for boys than for girls. And even after the entire high school cycle, which is this blue line, the effect is now more than double. It's all, all it's like 2.5 to three times more, more uh, uh, important for, for poor children than for high children. So the, the bottom line is that if we believe that these peer effects are important and then parents interact with them in the way the model predicts, well, you should expect that this uh, uh, COVID shock has a very, uh, 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 in an unequalizing effect. And I come to this uh, conclusion because I am over time, uh, I think I'll rather uh, uh, stop here. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. I think it really showcases the the power of these types of models that you can make such interesting predictions about the COVID situation. So now uh, we want to take questions from the Q&A and be aware that we are recording. So if you do not want to be recorded asking your question, you can type in to your question, like just add the fact that you would like Ulla to read your question rather than asking it yourself, if you would like not to be recorded. Mm. Yes, so thank you. So I'll uh, give the word to <coughs> Marco Francescone first, so you can unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, great stuff, Fabrizio, and you've done a great job in summarizing a very complex paper. I just have a couple of questions about the setup that you have. I mean, uh, you mentioned the fact that you have parents, uh, other children, peers, and, you know, which are based essentially in schools. Uh, but, you know, clearly there are other sources of potential social interactions that children have. Um, and I wonder the extent to which you can, in fact, open up your model, uh, maybe, you know, trying to negotiate what the data allow you to. I mean, the first time that I have in mind, for example, which are probably, which is probably not going to be available in Adelf, is social media. Uh, Clearly, there is a lot of stuff going on that kids on, on, on grade 7 to 12 will have to go through with social media. Another sort of related uh, question is related to the fact that, and I think you touched that looking at the COVID uh, uh, counterfactuals, is actually the fact that the data force you to look at uh, peers that you are forming in schools, but what about other schools and what about the neighborhood? Uh, this might be particularly strong in relatively poor neighborhoods where you have a lot of life that goes outside the house and goes well into the evenings and possibly the night. And the last, again, related question is the fact that parenting style is absolutely important, is very nice. You, you have clearly documented that very well uh, in the last few years, but there is also another dimension that is related to that, which is family structure. Parents are probably likely to change, and not just because they are changing tactics with the kids, but because they're changing themselves. I mean, there might be divorce, there might be remarriage. How do we take that into account in the model and then eventually in estimation? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Marco. These are three uh, great questions. And, uh, you know, uh, social media is uh, very high in our thinking. Uh, you know, this is 1994, so it was a different world. Uh, I think it's, as I said it's very briefly, it's, it's good time to try to make a data collection of this type, but uh, with, uh, you know, all what uh, concerns uh, uh, social media. One could uh, perhaps uh, suspect that it reduces the, how local the social the, the, the effects are. It could be. Uh, I don't know exactly. I don't know enough perhaps to, to, to give you a more informed answer. I suspect that still children talk with each other and they have the local 
through contacts and together with that they talk of the social media. Uh, my daughter is already old enough to ask her, uh, but this is a great, a great point. Uh, the other thing is, sure, there are other children that, 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 uh, locally that you meet outside of school and, uh, you know, more grown up. This would probably strengthen some of the effects uh, we, we emphasize. Um, the third question, sorry, Marco, what, what, uh, can you repeat your, your third point? Yeah, sorry, the, the last question was just related to family structure. Yes, it Par is. Okay, parenting yeah, yeah, might yeah. actually change due to the fact that you have a change in the family. Okay, so one thing we know in the reduced form regression is that uh, parental intervention is both different and the effectiveness of it changes when you have so-called intact family and non-intact family. And we have been uh, toying with that, uh, uh, what to do with that. And for the moment, we have decided not to have it because, you know, the model has already, uh, you know, a lot of uh, dimension when you, when you go to estimate it. I guess that from the theory point of view, the, uh, you know, the, the path the child takes could have uh, even an effect. So it could be that some of the uh, family crises are related to the difficulty a child encounter. And I think this would be an interesting uh, new insight. So how the stability of the family and how different in different uh, socioeconomic, uh, uh, ethnic environment this, this operates, uh, how it is affected together with affecting the uh, uh, success uh, of child in school. So, I mean, I think that it could be that we, what we discover that some of the separations that occur are related uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to problems with, with children. Perfect. So then I'll hand the word to Sherdelai Dasanai. Yes. So uh, thank you very much. So this is Skerdis and I from the University of Luxembourg. Thank you very much for, for the very interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, whether um, the gender of the kids affects the parenting style of parents. Uh, we, we know that from other uh, papers that there is uh, parents may hold different beliefs and different perspectives if they have daughters or sons. So I was wondering whether being authoritative uh, uh, parent uh, is depending also on the gender of the children. And second and related, uh, this, is this question about being authoritarian parent or is uh, asked to uh, mothers and fathers? So could you, would you get the same results if, it's, if you are doing it on, on both parents or, or only the father or only the mother? So could we- uh, the, the, question, the question we use is asked to children and not to parents. Uh, I, I should check if there is some question that could be matched. Uh, and if some of my co-authors is around, they might know. I suspect uh, the answer is that no. We looked into some, uh, you know, you look at the number of uh, uh, um, heterogeneity effects. So some are important, like for instance, parents, uh, 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 being uh, themselves high or low educated, and we discuss, you know, they don't change the big picture, but there is some effect. We did not find huge uh, effect on uh, uh, gender. It that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't, and, uh, and, but at least the way we try to introduce, we didn't. We, in some of our earlier work with documents that, uh, uh, you know, based on, on, on observational uh, data on survey and LSY, we did find some, some differences, but, uh, but not, uh, not uh, huge effects uh, here until uh, the point of the uh, losing a friend. And there, uh, it, uh, it is, uh, these are still preliminary results, but uh, it looks as if uh, uh, it has a bigger effect on boys uh, than, uh, than on girls. So I think it's, uh, honestly, this is an area where more can and, uh, and should be done. Perhaps uh, thinking back uh, of the model, we know that there is, you know, homophily in gender that is uh, well documented, but, uh, but perhaps uh, one should rethink about the building blocks of the model to have uh, more of a role uh, for, for, for gender. Yeah, thank you. So we have a question thank from you. Yoko Okuyama. 
Hi Fabrizio, thank you for a great talk. And I think my question is related to an earlier question, but I was also wondering uh, what authoritarian parents care about in terms of their kids' friendship. Um, do they really purely care about peers' skills or, or do they also care about race, ethnicity, gender or political attitudes of peers, parents, or et cetera, et cetera. And I'm asking this because this might matter for uh, the implication of the counterfactual analysis uh, of this segregation policies. And if so, uh, can you incorporate kind of more complex structure of homophily in your model? Yeah, I guess there are two parts. The first is, uh, uh, homophily uh, in other dimension than, uh, than grades. And uh, I mean, we were a bit constrained here by the parsimony of the model in, in looking uh, you know, potentially there are many dimensions that are important, but certainly this is important and that it has been documented. From the parents' point of view, uh, here our parents uh, only care about their own child in the sense that they would like they care about both the well-being. So they, they in principle, they, they take into account that there are uh, psychological costs that the, the, the child may suffer in uh, being forced to uh, not hang around with certain type of children. But then also they have this uh, forward-looking element that they care about the process of uh, uh, skill formation. So the tension here between parents and children is that children may uh, have some uh, uh, taste to hang around with, uh, you know, which is based, uh, of course, there is also a random shock there that could take care of other things, but they, we, we, we look at the, at, the, at the average pattern and, and they may like to hang around with children who are not uh, uh, more skilled than themselves. They are not more proficient than themselves. Parents have always this stronger element of uh, forward-looking uh, elements. So they, uh, they care more about the individual success and the children than the children do. Now, of course, uh, it could be that parents are also motivated uh, by other considerations, if they have some racial prejudice or other things like that. It's not, it's not, in, in, this, uh, uh, it's not in, in, in this theoretical framework, but certainly something that one could, uh, uh, could think to incorporate in, uh, in some future work. Thank you. Okay, then we have a question uh, from Shoshana Grossbard. Hi, thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. And uh, my first question is uh, that the term authoritarian is used in this case in a very specific way about, you know, which friendship the adolescents can make. And I understand it's measured according to the adolescents' responses. Um, but it's a little confusing and furthermore it had the term authoritarian could mean different things. The first thing that came to my mind when I heard the topic was that parents who are authoritarian will become much more involved in their children's scheduling and how they study which you know this this might actually be counterproductive in my opinion for adolescents if the parents are micromanaging their kids too much and 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 possibly uh, undermining their creativity so once you look at the outcomes and the child says my father or my mother didn't let me do this and that in terms of my friendships it might also have meant that they they interfered with their learning process and 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 they could be less less gifted at the time that they are being measured thank you it's a great question actually your way of thinking is very much in line with ours i mean this we, this is something we really discuss at length in the book and we argue that uh, authoritarian so sometimes even authoritative parenting uh, comes at the expense uh, of uh, you know creativity and imagination Joanna was a little negative uh, sounding on uh, uh, Swedish parents but we also emphasize that uh, they put a lot of emphasis on those values I want also to say that although we are focused on this dimension again parsimony here is this straight jacket perhaps 
But we have, we, did, we have also find, found that at the, uh, at the same level of disaggregation, so within the United States, other dimension that we associate uh, with authoritarian parenting, which in our mind as economists, it's interventions that tell children what they can and they cannot do, rather than more reasoning with them. So this fits, but other dimension like the value of obedience, for instance, they behave pretty much in, in the same way. And what we try to capture here through our production function, especially if you think about uh, just the total factor productivity term, is that these interventions are costly. They uh, impose a negative effect on the process of skill accumulation. However, in our estimates, in our data, and, you know, in our model, there is a beneficial effect on the peer effect. And sometimes that effect is potentially very large and sometimes parents don't have a choice. You know, we also allow high and low educated parents to intervene with different uh, effectiveness. So I would say we agree with what you are saying essentially here, because we, we want exactly to measure the cost of that type of intervention, but we refrain from saying, well, these parents are bad parents. We tend, we rather say, well, there might be some bad and some good parents, but uh, on average, they respond to the incentives that are uh, posed by the environment. <clears throat> so thanks so much, Fabrizio, for a great talk and um, all the participants we've had here today and your great questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have time for all of them, but Fabrizio has had the questions written down in the Q&A function, so he can read them himself. And we want to welcome you back in two weeks when Sonia Balotra will present her work on layoffs, benefits, and domestic violence. And it's at the same time again, using the same link. So very much welcome back then. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for coming.